Hot Springs Village Inside Out is a closer look at the greatness of Hot Springs Village, Arkansas and the surrounding areas, people, places, experiences. Hot Springs Village, Arkansas is one of the most beautiful places on the earth. Join me, Randy Cantrell, and my co-host Dennis Simpson as we engage in weekly conversations to explore Hot Springs Village Inside Out. Today's show is brought to you by Central Arkansas's favorite radio station, KVRE. Find them on the dial at 92.9 FM. Stream them live at kvre.com. Remax of Hot Springs Village is the largest real estate office with over 30 full-time agents and support staff. They're also an award-winning Remax office. Visit them to learn more about this beautiful place to figure out your real estate needs. Call them today at 1-800-364-9007 or find them online at explorehsv.com. They are Remax of Hot Springs Village at 1-800-364-9007 or online at explorehsv.com. So, Brandon, at one point you thought about leaving the village, right? We did. Just that one time. I'm Dennis Simpson, and it's Randy Cantrell, and we have who we have always wanted to have. We have Brandon Tedder. Brandon is with Renaissance Homes, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't think it would be an understatement to say the largest builder in the village at this time. Is that fair enough? That's probably fair. That's probably fair. Uh, that's and accurate. And accurate. <laughs> and accurate. So, Brandon, and, and we had chatted a little before, a lot of people that just see you in the village don't know that you've done a lot of work in Little Rock. You had a lot of other stuff, and we're going to cover that in a minute. We're going to go back and learn more about the history of Renaissance and the builders that you are. But how do you build in the village? I mean, square one, line one, statement one, sentence one. What do you need to have? In the village, uh, we definitely have a POA situation where uh, the permit process can be a little entangling uh they have made that a lot better over the last couple of years uh there's an electronic portal that you can load documents into and you know they're they're not quite as ominous as it reads like they are uh so that that's a process that you have to go through for a building permit in hot springs village we're not really a city we're a large neighborhood that happens to run like a city and so this large neighborhood has uh code enforcement and building inspectors and so forth. So they look out uh, for folks with regard to state codes, you know, plumbing, electrical, heat and air, and so on and so on. So they have their process for that building permit, just like you would have in a city with a few more things overlaid on it, specifically to the village. Uh, you may be on a mountain view lot in a certain subdivision. You may be on a golf course and have a few different rules or on a lake. Uh, so things to be mindful of there. Uh, Permit process is typically handled by the builders on behalf of the homeowners. And to get to going building in the village, you kind of got two tracks with us in specific. We have whole neighborhoods and things of that nature where we have named house plants. They're all tree names uh, since we're in the forest here in the village. So you may build the cypress or the aspen or the magnolia, whatever it may be. So I those think my plants, budget is my budget's more like the pine. That's probably what mine is. <laughs> we we, awesome. we try to make that easy on those plans. We've kind of got a predetermined script that we do on those house plans. And so we can easily work with somebody, whether they already live in the village or whether they may be coming from a different part of the country uh, on those house plans. So we know the willow, for an example, maybe 2,037 square feet, two car garage, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a list of amenities that go in the willow and we can apply that to a lot in one of our subdivisions, kind of on a turnkey situation and or on a lot that somebody already owns. The second track is more of custom home and we do offer that. We do a lot of custom houses in the village where we may draw the, help them draw the plans for some. Others have an architect or a draftsman uh, from somewhere else that they bring the plans in for. Um, so as far as the building process goes, whether we sell you the house, which is most of the cases when we do our named plans and we get the construction loan and everything else. Uh, so it makes it pretty easy for the prospective home buyer. They just make an initial deposit. We figure out which house we're doing on which lot, what the amenities are. And then they see us at the end, 
uh, financially speaking. If you're doing a custom house, that homeowner then is going to already own the land probably. So then they're going to go through a construction loan process, which we can help guide them through that with the bank. Uh, sometimes they still have a house, maybe in a different part of the country. And so they may do a bridge loan situation. Uh, so all that goes hand in hand with, with our initial meeting with them as far as what's the best way to accomplish the goal that they want, since there's different avenues to get to that finished home. Randy, I'm going to let you go. I know you've got one. Hey, well, yeah, so many. <laughs> it's like we're having a porcupine. Where do you begin? You know, kind of a thing. I don't, if I don't, if I don't understand, aside from the permitting stuff, Brandon, of the POA things, I'm unfamiliar with the village, but I hear it's this great place and I want to come and I want to investigate the place. And if you do come, you're going to fall in love with it because everybody does. I mean, unless you're, unless you're in love with concrete, if you're in love with concrete, and noise, yeah, and noise. if you're in love with concrete and noise and, and a lot of light at night, you're not going to love it. But other than you people, uh, if you do, uh, I mean, what are some of the things as you've built, however many homes you've built in there and you've encountered all kinds of customers, you know, I mean, what's, what's, what's the big fear that people have other than sticker shock and whatever else may come with having a brand new home? As far as the POA goes and, and, and Hot Springs Village in particular, is there anything that comes to mind? You know, I don't think, I don't think there's, there's a, big, a big fear with the POA. I think, I think a lot of times people come into a gated community like this that has such a big uh, POA presence. Again, it's kind of like City Hall in a small town. And so with that, there's a, there is a lot of rules and regulations. They're all pretty simple and easy to follow. But sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming if you start reading about all the different ordinances and that you may need a specific permit just to do your landscaping or to put up a fence or to put a dock beside your, uh, beside your house if you're on the lake and those sort of things. Uh, they're all pretty easy to work through. I think uh, the large sentiment of people, some people like a little bit more regulation and control. Some people like a little bit less. I think we got a good mix in the village. We've kind of got some processes in place to, to help us maintain the beauty of the, of the village and keep things within a parameter, but we allow people, you know, flexibility uh, on their property to do some things. So but, I think but, it's a good, good mix. But, no, what I was going to say is I, I want to, uh, we've got an appointment with, uh, do you work with Advantage Title much? No. Okay. Marla is, Marla is one of the ladies that I do a lot of my land sales with and with Pat. And, and, uh, when, when we get people on that have a specific do, job and duty, like you, you're, you're talking about, we're talking about going through the, the, uh, the POA permitting structure and everything. I'm going to spin that back around and go, but you know, if we've got a great builder like you, I don't have to worry about that. Right. So let me keep telling the benefits of working with a builder. If you know where I'm going with that, does that make sense? Okay. Got it. okay. So there's the noise. So unfortunately, Mr. Cantrell had an internet issue and we had to kind of regroup. So if you'll notice, there's just a couple of us instead of three of us here. But Brandon, we were, if I'm pick up where we were, if I'm not mistaken, we were talking about how you actually get started with the real, with the, the process. So you're saying that as a builder, I don't even have to really go to the bank. I mean, you're going to make the construction loan for me. I mean, I've got to be approved and all, but how does that work? No, not exactly. So you got two ways to do it. One of them is turnkey construction on a lot that we own. And that's just a deposit from a customer. We handle permitting, banking, everything. And then we see you at the end with your permanent loan, just like you're purchasing an existing home. Okay, you're just making so, a deposit and then you see us at the end. That's one way to go about it. But that, that, that's, a, that's on your lot and that's one of your plans, but I've got my correct. own lot. So how do we do that? If you've got your own lot, Yes, there'll probably be a construction loan for the customer if they're not paying, you know, cash or otherwise. So we can help them kind of navigate that uh, if they're unfamiliar. A lot of times folks may have done it 20 or 30 years before and they just haven't been in that that space. And now they've, they're have they moving to a new place. There's, there's a, a lot. There's some house plans. They know financing needs to be in place. What are the options? What do, what do we need to be looking at? Well, now, so as I understand it, to help with that. 
I'm sorry. Yeah. But as I understand it, when, when I go to the bank and my builder goes to the bank with me, you have a set of plans or we have agreed on a set of plans and it's going to go on my, my property. And I say, okay, you know, obviously the question is how much is this going to cost? But for the bank, the bank's always wanting to know how much is it going to be worth, right? So how do they determine that? So yes, before you go to the bank, I don't go with you to the bank. Not you personally, that, right? Not, no, before we do that, we do need to have some plans and specifications, kind of what's the game plan that we're doing? Yeah. How much do we think the house is going to be? Uh, in our case, we do fixed price. So it's kind of easy to know how much it's going to be. And then we turn those plans in as part of your loan process for an appraisal to the bank. So that way they can figure out, you know, what the loan value may be. Uh, ultimately, your deposit amount may be to them for your uh, mortgage. Well, I wanted to ask. So, I mean, uh, let's let's cut to the chase here. When we're be, because you've built, let's talk about Ciego, which is a rousing success. Ciego's right across from the trademark office on DeSoto. And this is where you and Pat took a, a, a subdivision that had a, a cul-de-sac that had 20 something of lots on it. And then did you build on 18 or 19 of those? Uh, I think 20, 20, there was 20, so a few people had double lots. So we had a few oh. more lots that had to start with. Okay. So, so how many plans uh, re were represented inside Ciega? Probably about five core plans right there. Some uh, of them now, with different fronts. Now I'm just going to say this off the cuff and you know, we're not beholden to anybody, but I'll, I'll endorse. I can go down that road a dozen times and I don't see the two houses that, I mean, there's 20 houses and there's five plans. I can't tell you which ones are identical. I mean, they look, what, what do you do to keep them looking unique or, or not just like they're kind of cookie cutter row houses? Sometimes it's just the color palette that you use. And sometimes you may have a different facade for the front of the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the interior layout, obviously on those few plans is going to be very similar on the inside. Sometimes you do do ceiling height changes and things of that nature uh, within the same floor plan. But I mean, those are, and, and I, I'm, I'm speaking for everybody here. Those are absolutely beautiful homes. It's a show place. You've done a wonderful job there. When I pull in, it's typically stone and, and brick mixed with some cedar or what it, is that? Is that rustic? What is that st style they call that? Uh, we call that rustic elegance. Rustic what? Elegance. Rustic elegance. I like that. That's I like right. that. That's right. You've got, you've got some modern touches on the inside of some of the houses. Uh, you've got some traditional. Um, and then the outside, kind of the theme there was a little bit rustic in the woods. Uh, we've got walking trails around the back of all the houses kind of making a loop there. So, so that, uh, that motif kind of played through with the design efforts, uh, you know, on the front facades of the houses. Um, we've got a new area in Pacifica and it'll have some similar floor plans too. They'll be a little bit more traditional as far as maybe brick and stone and a little bit less leaning toward, uh, toward the cedar finishes. Toward the rustic type. Correct. Well, I, I'm seeing that this, so, this is not to say that's all you can build. I'm certain you can build anything, but I'm seeing a lot of the farmhouse style come around. Is that just, I mean, it, it, let me explain. Let me explain. Just down the lake from us, Diane and I bought a property on Castellon. Beautiful property adjacent to the lake. Gorgeous. We walked in. It was 1976, frozen in time. The The bathrooms were nice, but the, the toilet, the sink, and the shower was chocolate brown and i am not exaggerating chocolate brown i mean <laughs> chocolate dark chocolate not milk chocolate dark chocolate brown and i'm sure at the time that seemed like a, a great trend right are we going to have the same thing with farmhouse in 30 years where we go what were they thinking i don't know i don't know a lot of people are, are a little bit sensitive to that when they do a farmhouse if they do a whole lot of uh, painted area with the hardy board and things of that nature yeah. they are thinking, I don't want to go too far, mm -hmm. you know, with it to, you do want to end up with somewhat of a timeless look that can go through, that can go through the ages with you. Uh, farmhouse uh, has had a little twist. We've, you know, people uh, in general across the country are doing a little bit more modern in their build design. And so the modern farmhouse is something a little bit less than rustic. When you get on the inside of a lot of these, a lot of these units, You'll see elongated fireplaces like you might see 
in California or somewhere. You'll see uh, tall windows in the back, a lot of open areas, less so it's not it's not leaning toward that craftsman-y style of a farmhouse. It is a little bit more modern in most of the designs. It sounds like you have to have a lot of finesse to get that those two to go together because when you think of modern, I'm thinking of Danish and sleek and no doorknobs and that kind of stuff right beside rustic where I've got a, you know, a, a waterfall countertop or a, 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 a what, what is, what are the big sinks that they say a farm sink or whatever? Apron front farmhouse yeah. sink. Yeah. The apron front sink. So it, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's, let's back up just a little more. Cause I know some of the questions that our, our watchers and listeners are interested in, I believe. What does it cost? Brandon depends, doesn't it? Definitely does. When's the last time you bought a car? Did you buy it by the pound? That's a great question, right? It's a two door. It's about this big. Yes, it is. It was blue. It was blue. That's right. Depends on what's in there. Depends on what's in there. Um, so we can certainly have those discussions over the last couple of years. Of course, we've been in a volatile, volatile state, you know, with, with lumber prices and all sorts of petroleum products and delivery fees and that sort of thing. I think we got a pretty good handle on that. So uh, case by case, you know, we're definitely able to uh, determine the cost of a house. One of the big questions after uh, how much does a house cost that people ask, uh, or sometimes that they don't ask, is how does that apply to their lot? Because in the village, we're not flat. You know, we've got terrain. It's beautiful. You know, rolling hills and, and, and where you are right now slopes down pretty heavily, it looks like, to the lake. And so had you been you know, building on a flat lot or building on that lot, that foundation costs from the slab, from the floor level down to the ground, whether that's covered with brick, stone or otherwise, has a cost to it. And so those things need to be taken into account. So, so before you know how much the car is, you know, we got to know all the conditions and what packages we want on there and that sort of thing, uh, but pretty easily done. Well, just across the way, uh, Gerald Ellison, I know, you know, Gerald is building, uh, Gary Mouton's house. And I was chatting with, Ger uh, with, uh, Gerald one time. And I said, well, you know, what about building on this particular kind of lot? And he said, when you build a spec house, nobody comes in to this beautiful spec house with stainless steel and beautiful marble countertops and goes, man, I really appreciate the work y'all spent on this foundation. Well, that $20,000 worth of square in this lot up really. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's all sunk cost. You know, that nobody sees that. Yeah. We had to build well on this house. Uh, the Arkansas room that I'm out is easily 18 feet in the air and the front of the house comes in right on the ground and it's not 60 feet apart, maybe 65. So at, at, what were you telling me? I think you had told sure. me one time how much a, a round of concrete block costs roughly per round. If, if I want to build my house two rounds up versus five rounds up, how much more is that per round, roughly? Well, it'd be tough to answer that because it depends on how big your house is. Oh, duh, of course. Yeah, but, sure. But each one would have a little rule of thumb so we could kind of tell you each eight inch lift, each block that you go up, that block, you know, uh, got concrete on the inside, probably brick on the outside, takes about five bricks to cover one of the blocks, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got that void, uh, that cubic feet of space that you have the earth fill or otherwise to raise that slab up. Uh, or if it's on a, a, a wood pier and beam system, then, then, you know, same situation. So uh, definitely, definitely does have a cost when you start raising those up out of the ground. You know, I think everybody kind of expects several feet on one end or the other. And we call that a flat lot in the village. <laughs> uh, but like in your case, you get to 18 feet or something. There's some conditions there. Yeah. Well, 18 feet is going to start to want to, want to wag, wobble and you have to have other bracing and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now, and the reason I was heading that, I thought you had said at one time, like each round on a regular home is like another $1,500 or so. So probably to, 35, 3,800 on 30, a really reasonable shaped house. Wow. 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 So it gets expensive quick when you've got a lot of brick and a lot of dirt and to build up. Absolutely. So, and, and, I'm trying to, and I, once again, these are the grayest of figures. People do not hold Brandon or me to these. No call and say, you said we could build. Uh, I'm hearing people talk about sale prices in the 175 a foot to 200 a foot ish ballpark. But once again, that deter that's, that's based on the ground condition. The, I mean, a million things, right? 
Absolutely. I'd say a good average for our stock plans is probably going to be somewhere in that upper 180s to 190 range. Okay. Okay. Plus so, or and, minus. and once again, this is for comparison purposes only. This is not your results may vary. <laughs> your results may definitely vary. Are you having trouble getting any, any materials? Have, has that been an issue? I think that's been an issue for everyone. Uh, yeah. We tell people, one of the big questions is, how long does it take to build oh, a new yeah. house? And so I say, well, I have to qualify the answer. It may mm -hmm. take six months to build your 2,000 square foot house, but we're going to do your contract and let you start picking out things well in advance of that. Because the windows, as an example, may be 16 weeks out. So four months and out windows. for windows, it takes less than two months to get up to the windows. So therefore, we need to wait a little while. We need to pick them out and order them and not really start working on your house yet, which is tough. Sometimes people get antsy. They want to, let's get started. And we can up to a point, and then we have to stop because we don't have any windows. So that's just one thing in the chain. Uh, I think a couple of other things people are having trouble getting. Uh, Pocket door frames, as strange as that seems, they're hard to find. Appliances, the dishwasher and the microwave are going to be the things that's going to be possibly late, uh, several months out. So really? it's just very interesting. So let me get this straight. So you could build me a house in, say, two to three months, as long as I didn't want windows or uh, uh, appliances. You could probably build a house for me, right? But it wouldn't be really uh, very livable, right? Definitely wouldn't be finished. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, the, is the typical turn time about six months nowadays? There is no typical. If, the, if, if, we, if we have selections not made or if it's a custom house, you know, you're, you're stretching the months way out there. Really? Uh, for, for, our, for our stock houses, yeah, I would say uh, in, that, in that range, six month build time. Best advice you have for somebody that wants to come to the village and build? What, what's the number one mistake they shouldn't make? Don't buy a lot without checking with somebody, whether it be, uh, you know, somebody you trust, a uh, realtor, builder, or otherwise. Somebody needs to evaluate that uh, slope and see. I had one not too long ago. They lived in the village, purchased a lot, and had house plans drawn. The lot was approximately 75 feet wide. The house was about 90 feet wide. And so that could be a problem. Did they have neighbors or? <laughs> <laughs> so they're back to, to back to the drawing board. <laughs> well, and let me come back to, and let me say things that might not be easier for you to say, get a builder, you know, that, and for what it's worth, let's talk about drawing those plans. What did they spend for those plans? 5,000, 4,000. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't cheap. And I no. think if, if you haven't been in this business, you don't know, you know, buying a stock set of plans off the internet is $2,500, much less having it on, you know, having a draftsman or someone make it for you and then come to find out it it's 15 feet bigger than your property. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah that I don't think a builder, I don't think a builder would make that mistake. I don't believe. Right. Should not. Should not. Uh, we have, <laughs> Diane and I have 36 and 38 Pizarro, a double lot on the non-golf side of Pizarro. Beautiful, beautiful area. Had our guys go in and clear it. And I thought, well, that's a pretty flat lot. Well, you know, the, the, the lot's probably 80 feet, something like that wide. And the other one's beside it, like 80 feet. And there's a slight slope between the two. Well, if you're going to have a double lot, you might want to build between in the middle of those and, you know, get it replatted like you did uh, Sergio. Number four, yes. four and six. I want to ask you more about that beautiful house, by the way. Um, but so you, you can get a double lot and you could build on that. And, and let's, let me be, let me go back to Sergio, which is on the Ponce golf course real quick. That particular house you built across the middle of the lot. And did, did one site have a, wa a water meter and the other one didn't? Uh, on Sergio, I think he built, I think he owned maybe three lots and built on the middle one. But we really? have crossed the lot line several times. Yeah, you can. There's a process to go through with that. Okay, so you can build on the lot, but I mean, for my point being, he has to pay. If there's three, he has to pay three POA fees. One of them might be at the water rate, and the other two might not be at the water rate. Like vacant lots or non-watered lots. Is that how they do that? Correct. Okay. Okay. 
back to my point of the question that I was getting at was, you know, if, if we're building a house and we want it to the, the 36 and 38, I'm sitting up and talking about you build in the middle of it and you think, well, that's not that much of a slope when you actually put the laser to it and it drops three feet over that range. You know, when the average person walks it and you think, okay, well, it changed a little in height. You don't realize it's knee height and per your number, you know, that may be another $10,000 worth of value as opposed to, or cost, as opposed to a really, really flat lot, right? That's true, but you're not, you're not figuring a house that low like that as an additional item. You know, that, that kind of comes as a standard. At some point, you begin to add height and difficulty as you go up. So it's not, not necessarily linear, but in no, an no. example where it was 3,500, uh, you know, if you're going 20 feet high, those last five feet are not going to be that. They're going to be a lot more than that. Yeah. Well, and, and so let, this kind of comes back around to, say, lumber prices. How do you compensate for that? I mean, from the time that you sign a contract to the time six months later or maybe seven months later, when it's done, what do you do? We started doing a lumber allowance as one of our allowance items. We have a fixed cost contract. We try to extrapolate what we think is going to be and say, you know, X amount is our lumber allowance. So that way, if it does go up a little bit, the homeowner's aware of that, you know, they have a lumber allowance. And hopefully, uh, we've actually had a few where they've come in under that, and then that, that rebate goes to them, because it's just a money allowance, kind of like a placeholder for what we think we're going to spend. Just kind of a best guess estimate. On that item, yes. Oh. Okay, yeah. so... Let me, let me go through the, some of the other scenarios. These are just things I know people are asking about and talking about. A lot of times here in the village, when you put something on the ground, when you put in a piece of, of concrete and you're on the ground, as soon as it goes in on the ground, somebody shows up and goes, hey, you got a concrete pad. I'll pay you for that. Let, let, me, let me pick the colors and the wallpaper and the backsplash and the whatever. What if they, is that a good idea? Is that a good idea to come in and go, oh, look, you, you've got foundation on the ground. We'll buy it from you now and let us pick the colors. And we're going to wait on the backsplash for another two months. And do you, how do you avoid that? How do you, that, that whole customized thing? We don't mind, uh, you know, helping people out with selections like that. In Pacifica, though, at this day and age where you are waiting for all the products, we pre-selected everything in, in all those houses. And wow. so those will be, uh, you know, unless somebody starts one from the ground up, the ones that we're doing for resale, yeah. they'll just be as they are. And so uh, that avoids, avoids that situation. We'll get them with, uh, with our office, kind of show them what color palette we are going with. And uh, maybe that fits with what they're looking for. If they're building a custom house course, they have that opportunity in the beginning to pick that stuff out because we're doing it again well ahead of time of clearing the lot. Well, so, and, and I'm, I'm wanting to dive into this just a little deeper, because I know this is a big thing for people. They want to have it customized so forth. So the Pacifica, and by the way, that's right across from the DeMonte main entrance there. It's just down from the corner of Ponce and DeSoto with Remax and, and those fine folks. Uh, that particular area is, is, is the term spec home? Is that what that's going to be? They are for sale. So in that regard, they are speculative. Uh, usually by nature, spec home means hey just a more of a cheap house you know a track home or something like that so definitely not that these have custom tile showers hardwood floors uh nice fireplaces some amenities they're all brick uh on the outside with some maybe some of them have stone or otherwise so nice homes for sale that we've we've just pre-selected the items that are going in there and uh i think that's a good route for part of our business so that that's what we're doing there so so how many uh, how many units are going to be there i know that you, I, I say i know i'd heard that you had purchased that from cooper as reserve and some of that's being replatted how many homes do you think you'll get in there i believe there's 18 in there to do and then we'll move over we've got some other areas to do similar things um we can talk about that at a later date at a later date, I, I'm, I'm not even going to let the cat that I know about in the bag out of that one because I know I, I have an idea. And, and um, good yeah, thanks for the bill. We, you and I have a lunch about that one. That's going to be fascinating if it's what I think it is. Uh, if it's over by a church, yeah, how about that? 
Um, but that said, what, what are we going to do? Somebody, some, some land guy apparently bought up all of the East end right outside the gate. What, what, what are they going to do with that over there, Brandon? Well, who are these people? Are I know they- it's, it's these, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you just to, and I'll share it with everybody real quick. Jeff and I, Jeff Atkins and I have uh, till this last year have for the last four or five years, we've invited every person that ran for the board to go to lunch with us. And we just wanted to know what they were looking at, what they were doing and whatever. And we invited one guy and he said, well, you know what the problem is? It's all these fat cat land investors that own all the land around here. And I kind of looked, turned and looked at Jeff and he looked at me and I thought, and we're buying this guy lunch. So I guess we're the problem. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think we were fat cat land investors, but we owned more than anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're in that position. So let me, let me be clarify here just outside the East gate on the left and right side, as you're leaving the gate, the fine folks at Cooper had had that land for sale for reserve for a long time. There were discussions of putting an RV park there. There were a lot of discussions about putting a lot of different stuff there. But Brandon, if I'm not mistaken, Renaissance has picked that up. And and I see a sign that says we're going to have some commercial development or what are we doing there? Correct. Yeah, it won't be too long. We'll be putting a road in right there to a commercial development. Yeah. Uh, it'll be really, really nice. Uh, just one entrance and exit on DeSoto. And then eventually we might come out beside the shell station over there onto highway five. Uh But for right now, we're going to come in off DeSoto and we have, uh, we're going to do a strip center. Um, we're going to move our office there and had some interest from, you know, other, other parties, whether it be restaurant office type or otherwise. Um, so we'll see how all that goes, but we do have quite a bit of property in there, uh, to be developed. So the only specific plan is to get us moved down there, which will be awesome. Uh, So we've been looking forward to that. And it's been a little slower than what we'd have liked, but I think it's about to to get going. Well, I think this is the perfect time to come back around to where the day when you thought, hmm, we might leave the village. And and a lot of people didn't know you weren't in the village or hadn't always been working around the village. Tell us the genesis of the Renaissance homes. You said y'all had been working in Maumel and North Little Rock. Uh, in the 2000s. And then there was this thing called 2008. What happened? 2008 uh, financial markets fell apart and our circle for building houses and doing at that time we would do remodels or anything else. Somebody may call they're an hour drive away. We just want to freshen up our kitchen a little bit with granite tops. An Perfect. hour we'll, away each we'll way. See it. We'll see you at three o'clock <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> so our circle got bigger. Uh, obviously, things improved, and we found ourselves pretty busy in a wide circle, about an hour from Little Rock, uh, including the village. I think the first house we did in the village was 2007. Um, anyway, so we started wanting to pare down that circle a little bit, and we had two or three jobs in the village, maybe four, and then back to two, that sort of thing. And so it was on the radar of getting cut and just focused on central Arkansas, central Little Rock, or rather, right around that area. And so we didn't do that. Uh, Instead, we started getting ourselves kind of out of Sherwood. We used to build a bunch of houses in Sherwood for many, many years out toward Jacksonville, Air Base, and so on. And so uh, over the last few years, we were Sherwood, uh, finishing up what we had over there. We didn't buy any more property, Uh, Maumel, Little Rock, and Hot Springs Village. Really enjoy working in the village. Um, uh, we started doing more and more projects in the village and finally decided, you know, that needs to be our building home. So we kind of started making plans for that. It takes a little time uh, to divest yourself of different areas and properties and things of that nature. But uh, matter of fact, last week, we just closed our last house for somebody uh, outside the village. Really? And we have no... Uh, customers no spec houses and no lots outside the village for renaissance homes uh, i think that's a way of, i think randy what does the term randy use uh, all your chips are in on that one right we're all in on the village well and, and and for, I, may, I may have i may have some investments here or there that that are sure. in one thing or another but as far as renaissance homes and building activities uh which is definitely our primary business we're 100 percent focused on the village and uh, and that's why we were making plans with Cooper 
uh, and with the POA on buying some, uh, you know, some lots that they have in inventory and things of that nature. So we just, we're really excited about the future for the village. Um, it is, it is a strong community. We've, we have just got people coming from all around. So I think, I think it's good things ahead for hot springs village. I think so too. And, and there's things that it's not that you can't say it's easier for me to say, let me cut to the chase here real quick. Number one, if you have subs that are traveling an hour and, and these subs are, are not poorly paid, but they're not fantastically paid, but they could be very productive in two hours because when they get in that truck and they drive for an hour to get to that job site, they got to get in that truck and drive for an hour back from that job site. So instead of eight hours of work today, we only got six hours of work, right? So it, it can be very expensive to move your subs around like that, right? Could be. Could be most of our, most of ours, we have different subs in different areas and some of them follow us wherever we go. No, but what, so, what I was saying was, is that I can yeah. see the reason you don't want to be too geographically dispersed because you spend your time just driving in the truck, right? Exactly. Our superintendents, project managers have too much travel time in that regard. You know, if, you, if we were working in Sherwood now with all the stuff we have going in the village um, or Conway or Jacksonville or some other place. And, and, so. and, and let me interject this one too. Once again, this is something that wouldn't be easy for you to say. I know probably 10 or 15, I know a dozen builders who say they wouldn't work in the village. It's just too hard. And the bottom line is it's not too hard. You just have to navigate those waters and learn them, which frankly, I think you've invested the time to figure out how and do. Is that fair? That's fair. Every area is different, has its own challenges and benefits, and we're no different in the village. Um, again, it just kind of goes back to that permit process and oversight and those sorts of things. You know, if you're used to building out in the county somewhere, uh, there's very little to do uh, to get started. But, but once you start moving into the city, moving into a neighborhood, there's, there's obviously going to be rules and regulations, uh, covenants and bills of assurance, those sort of things that you have to abide by. Well, let's talk about the very first one that surprises most people that, that they don't know about if they're not using a builder. What is a grinder pump? Why do I need, why is it $5,000? What am I doing here? <laughs> the village is, uh, has a lot of great things going for it. It is challenged as far as a gravity sewer system would go. Because it's hard to many be hills from everywhere. Yeah. So uh, most cities have some sort of a force main. It's just uh, not in each particular yard. So the village system for that is, there's some high pressure lines that go through the neighborhoods in front of the houses in most cases. And each house has a grinder tank. So your plumbing's just like normal. It's gravity out of your house into that tank. And uh, from then it's pushed along to the next catch station and pushed along uphill and downhill and everywhere to the treatment plant uh, located in the village. And uh, that, that is the sewer system. So I've had several customers that, that said, tell me about this septic system. Are these lines going to be out in my backyard? No, it's a closed system. It's a closed system, just like anywhere else. It's just a different way of doing it. Uh, instead of gravity running down to the sewer system, we have to literally push it up some of the hills and down some of the other hills. And so it, the, the grinder actually grinds the wastewater and the, the manure, the, 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 the material, and then pushes it and, and pressurizes it and puts it back out on the main line so it can go back to the treatment station, right? Absolutely. Any other, I mean, is, is there any special thing with water or root power? I mean, the power's underground. That's one thing that a lot of people don't know. Uh, any other special considerations? Uh, no, it's kind of interesting. Most times uh, there's a municipality, a city that owns the water service, like Central Arkansas Water, something like that. So the village has their own water. It's actually great water. It is. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah. And so uh, Public Works puts that in. That's part of your permit fee. Uh, they also install the grinder system and are kind of responsible for that moving forward. So the homeowner really is kind of hands-free at that point. They don't have any responsibility on that. Let, let's just, and, and just wrapping up here, and you've been so gracious today, and Randy's had to drop off. We've had technical issues, but I, Brandon, one other, one quick question. Would you consider coming back and chatting with us more about specific questions as they come up? Absolutely. Well, we'd love to have you. And I, the reason I, I bring that up, 
let's talk about custom versus and spec is not a pre-built. How about that? Uh, because you're making, you're basically making inventory that you know is highly desirable and not spec house like is lowest common denominator. And I, I understand your point. I'm not trying to make a spec house sound like it's just a cookie cutter model when you're building really high end. Oh, nuts. Two things I wanted to talk about. Uh, in Siega, did you do, was that aging in place? Is that what you did there? Not necessarily. Okay. Most of the doorways are a little wider, those sort of things. Um, you well, know, let's, talk it, it let's talk about what it is first. Tell me what aging in place is. Aging in place is just trying to uh, control your environment a little bit as you're aging inside your home. So there's several things to look out for in that regard, and you can move into specifics if somebody has, you know, an issue for themselves. But here's a few high points that, that would be, uh, you know, that you, that you may want to consider if building a new house. So a little bit wider hallways to navigate should we be, you know, get that knee replacement or whatnot. We're on a little scooter or, or wheelchair for a short period of time. Or crutches. Wider, wider doorways. Uh, you know, if you can go to three feet, that's great. Two foot eight work in most cases um showers getting in and out of showers getting in and in and out of toilet rooms you know you got to have access for those sort of things so um having having that opening enough where you could get in there should you be in a position compromised you know you may want to have handrails bars in there at least have blocking in the wall so later on if you wanted to install those you know it's easily done uh, to put those in. So there's just things like that. Um, you know, round handles, round knobs are tough. If you get arthritic hands, you know, late in life, it's hard to grab that circle and twist it. It's real easy to use a lever and just kind of push down on that lever. Switches, the paddle switches, the rocker switches that go back and forth, turn the lights on. You can hit those with a knuckle. You can, you can bump those and turn them on a little bit easier than the old toggle switches. So those are just a few things. Those are some mind. great ideas. And, and so some of these were incorporated in Siega, but maybe not all of them. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, it depends on the situation. Okay, okay. I've, For the I've most got part, a, most of that's in there. Yeah, I've, I've, I've come up with a million questions because I'm wondering 20 years from now what you're, um, I can't imagine walking through Siega with you in 20 years and going, well, we did that right, but man, we didn't think about the, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to come back, what are the benefits of building a spec house? This could probably be a whole nother show. What are the benefits of building a spec or a, a prepare, buying a prepared home, something you've already built and got on the ground versus a custom, you know, well, and, and for me, and I'm certainly not in real estate, I work with real estate a lot, but when I hear somebody say, oh, it's a custom floor plan in my mind, I'm thinking, Somebody thought it was a great idea to add another 10 feet to the bathroom and make the bedroom another eight feet smaller. And, you know, somebody <laughs> take a standard plan and butcher it up and then call it custom. And you're like, who would want this? Right. So give me some pros and cons here. Keep me out of the weeds, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, you know, a house that's already being built, that's not spoken for, helps the homeowner in a, in a lot of different ways. Somebody moving to the village. They can, pro depending on what stage it's at, they can see what they're getting. Mm. Uh, they know how much it costs, which is great. Uh, the timeline's compressed. So if they're selling a house in an area, you know, a lot of residents to the village are from areas where they can sell their house in a day, kind of like we can uh, here, mm. you know, so, that, so they're going to be homeless. If they put their house up for sale, they'd like to know where they're headed and move one time. Uh, so that's definitely a benefit. A lot of people find it fun to go through a custom home building process. Other people find it somewhat stressful. And so in that regard to kind of alleviate some of that stress, you can look at a house that somebody else has already selected all the items, but you're still getting that new home with warranties and nice modern finishes, if that's what you're looking for and those sort of things. So, so there's definitely a place for it. Uh, you know, you've got the custom home buyer uh, who doesn't have to be a big house when you say custom home. It could be well below 2,000 square feet and have specific amenities that fit uh, their lifestyle or need or just the way they're accustomed to. 
And, uh, and so those could be custom homes that people don't have a problem waiting. They don't have a problem spending the time because they know they're not going to find. They've got so many specific ideas that they're not really going to be able to package that up into a house that's already there. So a lot of people try out the village with a second home and then end up loving it and move here full time. Um, I can see, I can see those folks buying a spec house. I see people moving in, um, all the time. And a spec house doesn't have to be a small house either. It can be a small house all the way up. So there's a, there's a big range for both and, and we need both, uh, in yeah. the village for sure. Well, what is the bell curve house right now? And by bell curve, I mean, what, what, what's the, most houses and the, 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 the most needed would be, uh, and everybody's fixated on a three bed, two bath, because they typically use one of them as an office, blah, 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 blah. What's the standard most wanted product? I think the realtors would probably know better than me. It feels like, uh, there's just more people in the price range and probably also in the market for that three bedroom, two bath, uh, 2000, 22, 2300, down to 1800. There's probably more people in that size range and price range than there are uh, above or below. Okay, so right across from Ciego, behind Trademark, back in that, I call it the Interlagos area because it's between Coronado and between Balboa. In that particular area, I don't know if you know this, but they have the, the every one of the subdivisions has a minimum size square foot. You can build a 1200 square foot home in those subdivisions. Um, oh, Palacia, I'm trying to think of what some of the other names are. Can you imagine anybody building a 1200 square foot home and having it have a, a marketability in this obsessed three, two world that we live in? Absolutely. You can build a three, two, that's 1200, or you could build a really nice two bedroom, uh, that's 1200. And then I think there would probably be a market for it. Uh, the smaller you go, it becomes, a uh, you know, your square foot cost typically goes up a little bit based upon the building permit, landscaping, driveway, lot clearing, dirt shaping, all of those things have nothing to do with the square footage of the house. So those costs are now divided by a 1200 foot house instead of 2200, 3000, et cetera. So, so that comes into play. And let's talk custom house just for a second. Thank you, Brandon, for enjoying during some of my questions here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so many of the properties, let, let, let's look around, uh, Coronado, uh, Cortez is a, is a extreme area, Cortez golf course and Cortez, uh, Lake ditches. I mean, they're steep. They're, they, some of them have a driveway that's 200 yards long, but there's a stunning view of the lake and there's, you know, so, so many times because I don't know, I, I would, I'm guessing in particular on the East, it's a little better, but maybe, maybe what you and I would consider flat i mean really flat maybe 20 percent of the lots in the village maybe maybe 30 probably less than that probably less than that really For well, sure. so let's work in this in this genre okay if if 80 percent or more are going to be unlevel lots how do we maximize that well for cooper the house i'm sitting in right now you walk in on the first floor you have a lower walkout basement area and everybody goes wow all the square feet maybe you don't need that many square feet. Maybe it's going to be more expensive. Maybe tell me the pros and cons. Not really a pro or a con. It's more a personal choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you're not going to get a house under 2000 square feet. That's multi-level, you know, that makes any sense there. So you're going to be in a little bit bigger home. If you, if you do have a lot for a walkout and a lot of times that's what is available as you say, around some of the lakes and, and other properties, those slopes are there. So we have to deal with them. Um, so there's, there's some really cool uses for that space. We've seen uh, indoor golf range <laughs> in a basement, really? uh, wood shops. Mm. I had a, a, a musician area with a bar in one. We, there's all sorts of things. Extra garage where, where you do have the ability to have a driveway, you know, the lot's wide enough to get around to the back just to store that car that we're going to work on and maybe bring out next, you know, next spring, take it for, take it for a loop. Uh, there's all sorts of uses for that space. We've had people who wanted those sort of homes just so they could have 
storage because they hadn't yet pared down from their big house, wherever they are moving from. And they didn't want to put things in storage. They wanted time to go through it and, and really get down to what they wanted. And so they welcomed that space and figured that they would, you know, maybe finish it out one day, maybe not, but they had storage right there uh, at their address, you know, where they could go down and work on things. I've had, I've got one right now. Lady's a fantastic artist and she does paintings and pottery. And so there's going to be a, a kiln down there. So there's all sorts of things that How you can do. Cool. With the How cool. So what advice would you give somebody that's doing a walkout? Number one, you want a French drain, huh? Around the front. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Water table in the village is, uh, you hear people say, I have water issue. Uh, it's a shale base, you know, the hydrology, the pressure of water in time, you, you could be on a lot and it rains slowly for a week. And all of a sudden a little spring pops up. You can be on a different lot that stays dry during that same condition, but that spring pops up when it rains hard for three hours. Uh, so those things happen. You just, you know, most of the builders are well familiar with how to mitigate those conditions um, and keep you dry and, and nice for a walkout basement. Well, I've, I've opened that can of worms. So let me just say something real quick. So if you're on a lake, typically, you know, you're going to have a drainage. You, you, the, you, nobody looks up at the lake. Everybody looks down at the lake because the property of front. So that means that your driveway is up on the road. There's a driveway that comes down. And then typically any of the water for the neighbors or your front yard or whatever comes down to the front of your house and has to be dispersed one way or the other. And a lot of times it's a French drain, or as you say, there's membranes or whatever other ways, but you want to, to drain that water away. So it goes back down to the lake and doesn't just lay on the front of your house and eventually corrode those or erode those concrete blocks and start coming into your basement. Is that sometimes what happens? Well, that you've laid out a condition there, but there's yeah. all sorts of ways that you wouldn't do that. A walkout basement, you don't do a full basement in most cases really? in the village. A full basement is where that water sitting against the front of your house. If you go straight down, there's a livable area. Normally we don't have that. You're going to have gravel area behind and do a partial basement. So that gives you all kinds of chances to do other things. Waterproof the front of the house. You know, you're not going to have uh, too many problems there. And then surface drainage is, a, is at least as important as the other. So you want to catch the water and not have to contain it in a catchment system. You want to prov let gravity provide where it's going to go on the surface. So you can watch this little swale or little depression kind of carry that heavy rainwater to where it's going to end up. Makes complete and total sense. It really does. And I understand now I'd, I'd heard people say before, we typically don't make a full basement in the village. And I was like, why? And I see a lot of HVAC equipment and, you know, heaters and in that subspace and whatever. And you talk about the gravel there, well, it makes complete and total sense. Well, is there anything we haven't covered that we, <laughs> that you would like to share for the first time home buyer or builder? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Duh. Brandon, if somebody wanted to talk to you about buying a home or building a home in the village, how would they contact you? They would probably check our website out, renaissancehomesonline.com. And they can find all sorts of things about the village, uh, kind of navigate through what the village is. What do we offer? Look at golf courses, lakes, hiking trails, et cetera. Dive into neighborhoods. They can see some of our named plans. We're always kind of in a transition mode as far as website goes. We don't update it as, as often as we should, but we always have things to update it with, if that makes sense. So if they, if they check that out, uh, give us a call. We can kind of get started, get them some information, and uh, hopefully get them to come see the village. And from there, it will take care of itself. Yeah, I think you will. Village I think is a great will. place. I think the answer to, to part of this is, is that when you have a qualified builder that knows how to navigate the system in the village, it's, it's no sweat. If you want to, if you think you can come to the village and just, we're just going to build our own home and we're going to, there's going to be a steep learning curve would be my suspicion. Is that fair enough to say? I would say. Well, you've been very gracious today, Brandon. Thanks for <laughs> joining us today on Hot Springs Village Inside Out. Randy will be back. And thankfully, Brandon, you'll be back. We'll have some more questions and we'll talk to you again soon. Appreciate you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate right. it. Bye-bye. And... 
Thanks for listening to another episode of Hot Springs Village Inside Out, a podcast where Hot Springs Village, Arkansas is the star. Please subscribe to the podcast. You can do that by visiting our website, hsvinsideout.com, and tell a friend.